Hi, I'm Jenny Barnes. I um, teach computer science and math at the Matsu Middle College in Mat Matsu Borough School District. And I'm Noelle Valentine, and I'm a CS teacher out at Sioux Valley High School. Um, so today, I'm really excited to share with you guys about Girls Who Code. It's been something that Jenny and I are have been passionate about for a few years now, both running clubs and summer camps in our district. Um, so we're really hoping to kind of push that excitement statewide. Uh, the mission of Girls Who Code is to close the gender gap in technology by supporting uh, girls in K through 12 and just kind of changing how they uh, see programming and computer science and the role it plays in their world. So uh, I really hope that this is something this is something that you can bring back to your communities. So the first thing I'm going to show you guys is actually the Girls Who Code headquarters. Um, so if you are uh, not a professional programmer yourself, but are curious about it and want to share all of that awesome information with girls in your, in your communities, uh, they have all of the support you could possibly need to make it happen. So don't feel like you need to know everything before you teach it to kids or show kids this website. Um, so on the Girls Who Code HQ, they've got a lot of um, resources in their facilitator toolkit. Not only are they supporting uh, in-person clubs right now, but they're also really making an effort um, to support virtual clubs. So don't feel like just because we're in the middle of a pandemic that this is uh, not going to be something you can make happen. Um, one of my favorite things on the Girls Who Code HQ website is the women in tech section. They really make an effort to expose girls to um, computer science in all these different parts of the world and in different fields so that they don't feel like, oh, well, a programmer is someone who sits in their basement and just codes away all day long. It's like, no, it actually, you can have computer science and dance and computer science and art and really uh, show them that it's integrated into all these parts of our world. Um, the other cool thing on the uh, Girls Who Code HQ website is the sisterhood activities. Um, don't be put off by the sisterhood piece. Uh, it's really just a lot of really good team building and communication skills and getting the girls to really uh, bond together as a club. I'm going to bring us back to this. I just want to jump in and kind of reemphasize this no experience required. I really think that, I mean, I didn't know how to code when I started teaching computer science and started Girls Who, Cl Girls Who Code. And I think learning with the students, you're really modeling all of the things that they're going through and like how to approach some of it. So it's a great way to teach is to learn with them and model those skills. Yep, and all the lessons that you need for your girls to learn the CS content and learn how to code, it's all in Girls Who Code HQ. So you don't have to do any lesson planning. Um, all you are doing is really facilitating the conversations and directing them to the right videos and pulling those up on the screen. But really everything you need to make this happen lives in Girls Who Code HQ. Um, and you're just providing the fun and the excitement for what you guys are doing in the space. So there's a couple of different ways that Jenny and I have um, used the Girls Who Code program before. And the main one over the past few years has been in clubs. And so I think we're over 20 Girls Who Code clubs in the Matsu right now, which is awesome. We've got a pretty big movement happening. Um, and right now we're kind of transitioning from our in-person clubs to virtual clubs and providing that opportunity for our kids who are uh, choosing to learn at home. And so um, at least for my in-person clubs, I've had a really, really good luck. Uh, it's a lot of project management and having the girls kind of work over the course of a semester um, on an app or a website and letting them kind of explore a community issue together and have a lot of discussion. Um, this picture is from a couple of years ago where they made apps of how they were going to help their classmates. How, what kind of app would you want as a student at Sioux Valley so to better your experience here? 
And uh, one thing I really appreciate about Girls Who Code is that it's very community focused. Um, it's not about just building a game and seeing how it goes. It's really um, how you can bring computer science back into your community to be helpful, to be socially useful. And uh, the, the studies show that, that um, girls tend to get more engaged with computer science when you do bring in that community piece. Um, I know one of my first clubs, uh, if you've ever done um, first robotics, there's kind of this uh, theme where not everyone has to be the programmer, everyone has different roles, they might be the social media director for your team. Um, and I really tried to bring that to my girls who code club and I had one exceptional coder, but we had a lot of conversations about what project we were going to do and had people doing other roles that maybe weren't as coding heavy. And we um, finished a project that year. It was an app for the state fair that's right here in our community. And it won some prizes at the fair. So it didn't ever get used because there was a pandemic, <laughs> but um, it was a really, it was one of my more positive experiences. And we've had really good luck partnering with the local senior center and letting our girls kind of act as the um, tech help. And so they've built websites for local community groups and it's nice for them to get affirmation from outside of the school building as well for their skills. Um, right now we're transitioning to virtual uh, and kind of hosting clubs through Google Classroom or its own website and meeting over Zoom has been pretty successful, um, especially because all of the uh, kind of assignments projects are all online anyway. And Girls Who Code has put out a whole new set of uh, virtual sisterhood activities so that you're still providing an engaging uh, club meeting every week. And then Jenny, do you want to talk about All Who Code? Um, so I'm in a, a smaller school and they were the my student leading the club was really interested in just having more diversity in our club. And I had a lot of boys that wanted to join the club and they came up with the name All Who Code instead of Girls Who Code. And so we did have um, people of every gender in our, in our club and it worked out really well. We still use a lot of the sisterhood activities and the videos where you got to see women in tech just modeling being a woman in tech. And so we still had that focus and it, it worked out really well. And Girls Who Code as an organization does support people um, using their program in that kind of flexible way where if it works better at your organization to run an all who code club, um, you're still welcome to use the curriculum and the programming and everything. Uh, they just really want to emphasize that like, yes, both girls and boys need to be exposed to more women in tech and STEM um, and that the sisterhood activities are totally applicable to a, a mixed gender group. Um, and so just kind of staying true to the mission of Girls Who Code uh, with bravery and community and activism and everything. Um, a conversation that's constant for our district at least is uh, recruitment, is how do you get the girls to sign up, especially if you are, um, if you're trying to get girls who don't necessarily sign up for coding classes or tech classes, but you really do want to get girls from that really like art, that really like sports. You want a kind of a, a balanced group because the discussions they're able to have and the community projects they're able to accomplish are pretty incredible. Uh, some solutions for recruitment has been, um, yes, going to classes and putting up flyers and reaching out to them, but a lot of it is finding small pockets of girls who are already involved in different activities and getting them to bring a friend. Um, it's much more difficult, especially for a middle school age group to get individual girls to join. Uh, and so we highly recommend trying to recruit in pairs or more so you can get different friend groups coming in together. In addition, I think a personal invitation and encouragement goes a long way. So if you have a relationship with students in your, in your building already, just making sure you reach out to them one-on-one -on -one has been a huge resource for me to get my clubs full. Also food. If you provide food, they'll usually show up. We also had glittery posters with unicorns and rainbows. So. <laughs> All right, can you um, talk about camps? 
Yeah, so um, our school district has been really supportive. Um, and from the very beginning, I think we've had four summer camps now. Um, and they're already looking forward to having our fifth and they do a week long summer camp, inviting girls from 612. Um, and I've had a chance to be a part of a few of them. Noelle and I have done a couple together as the teachers and it's been such a fun experience. And you can see there's some pictures here um, when we had it in person. And then this year we got to go virtual and Noelle and I um, figured out how to do that on the fly and had a really fun time. So um, one of the most important things that I, that I really try to bring to the camps and make sure we have is a lineup of local um, leaders, uh, women leaders in tech, or just local um, female leaders to come and work with our students and engage with them. Um, so not only are they just like giving a speech, because sometimes the girls are kind of young to be super engaged with that, but also have them invite them to do some activities with the girls and learn along with the girls. So we had um, musicians this summer, we had um, and two different women, one had just graduated with uh, from UAA with a computer science degree, and she came back to speak to the students. And then we had another lady in our community that works in, as a computer scientist. So um, one of the other aspects of having a virtual camp was um, Noelle's beautiful idea was to send home a swag bag to all the students. And it was a challenge to get all of the coordination and the pieces together. But you can see in the photo that everyone's got their little rubber ducky for debugging and some sunglasses and different swags so we could have that engagement piece even though we were online. And we had students dancing during some of our activities and um, working together in small groups to complete projects. Um, we kind of focused our projects around the micro bit and Noelle, I think, is going to talk a little bit more about the micro bit. All right. So the micro bit is kind of our, our current obsession, I guess, as, as a computer science group. Um, so these little guys, it's just a really easy way to get um, to kind of pull the coding activity off the screen and into their hands. And it is a joy for students and adults alike. It is a people pleaser. Um, and so the history of the micro bit is basically in 2016, uh, a group in the UK gave a micro bit to every student in the UK. And so there is a lot of resources behind it. There's a lot of help. There's a lot of lesson plans. And um, I just think they're great. So for being something this small and it looks incredibly simple, uh, it can do a lot. So there's quite a few sensors on it. It's got a thermometer and an accelerometer and a compass. Um, I think it's got a, let's see, a light sensor on it too. The new ones have microphones and speakers also. Um, and so this is what I've been using in my clubs because I love to bring in kind of whatever new fun coding tech that I can find. I like to bring it in and test run it with my girls who code class because they're usually game and really excited about it. Um, and this is like Jenny said, what we used for our camp because it's really easy to hand these out. Um, price wise, a single set can run you between like 10 and 15 bucks. And that comes with like a battery pack and a little USB cable. I would recommend just getting a class set for about a hundred bucks and then you get 10 of them. Um, and so what I'm going to walk you guys through right now, so hopefully we can kind of all follow along, um, is how I would kind of start a Girls Who Code coding activity um, with my group. And so I'm going to jump in and just say too that I was really surprised when we, because Noelle was doing this with us in our, our virtual club or camp, and you don't actually have to have a micro bit for students to follow along. So I know a lot of times you'll have students fall out of the sky into your club and you gotta make things happen on the fly. This is a totally doable activity even if you don't have a micro bit, which you don't right now, so. Forgot to mention that, thanks. <laughs> um, and we are gonna be coding in blocks. So no fear coding, this is all good. So if you go to microbit.org, this should be your landing page. And I'm going to kind of take this slow so that um, hopefully people are able to follow along. And so we're going to go straight to Let's Code. Uh, one thing that I really like about the microbit, I use it for 
girls in grades six through 12. So even if they've taken a few programming classes from me already, that they, uh, they are still finding ways to challenge themselves with this tiny little bit. Um, and part of that is because you get to choose your programming language with Microbit. So you can use blocks, which I would say kind of our younger middle school are more comfortable with. Um, if they're ready to jump in with Python or JavaScript, they can also do that. Today though, we are doing blocks, which is the very coding. For the very new out there, Scratch, if you've seen Scratch, that's your block coding, which we'll see in a minute. And then some of those others are text-based text languages that are a little more challenging. So the Microbit website comes with a lot of tutorials, which is great because you can just direct kids to pick one that looks interesting, that kind of strikes their fancy and they're really excited about it. Um, today, we are going to do flashing heart. And then you can choose blocks. Okay, uh, one thing that I like about the workspace in Microbit is that the tutorials go step by step, block by block, um, and there's a little video of you what you should be doing in terms of dragging your blocks around. So the first step for this tutorial is we're going to open up the basic drawer and we're going to grab the show LEDs and we're going to drag it over to forever. And so now that our LED grid is in the forever loop, we are going to draw our heart. And so you can draw just by clicking in the grid. And it should automatically be showing in the simulator off to the side here. So if I were running my actual hardware as we plugged into my computer, and I can push the program onto this guy and this would start lighting up. But for the sake of demo, we're gonna use the simulator today. All right, so that was step one. I'm moving on to our next step. We're gonna grab a second show LED block because right now you'll notice that it's stable, right? It's not blinking. We want it to be a flashing heart. So we're gonna grab another show LED block and put it right underneath the heart. So now what should be on a loop is a heart and nothing, heart, nothing. And it should be blinking. And if it's not blinking, then I would take a look at your show LED blocks and make sure that you don't have two empty ones, you don't have two hearts. One needs to be a heart, one needs to be empty. Instant gratification. In three blocks, you now have a flashing heart. What I'd like to do now, since that was like pretty easy, hopefully everyone was able to make the, the heart flash. Um, I'd like to challenge you a little bit, which is something I would do with my girls after we go through kind of a step-by-step -step tutorial. Like let's extend our understanding of what we're doing here right now. So the challenge is uh, I would like you to make a happy face and then it goes away and then it turns into a sad face. And so it should alternate between happy face, sad face. So if you want to pause the workshop right here and see if you can make a happy face and a sad face happen, that would be great. Okay, so a big part of our clubs is just reflecting on our experiences. And that's a way to build community and really get girls connected to their, so they're not isolated. I think working in isolation is um, not as exciting for the girls. So making sure we bring them out and, and share our feelings and our experiences is really important. So we always ask, 
Um, and and I've found that this order of questions is really important because you, know, you start by asking about their challenges. There's usually some frustration with coding. And we'll talk about how you, when you just hit a bug and you can't get past it, you just want to throw your computer out a window at some point. It's a very common experience that coders have. And finding memes online from um, different experiences that coders have getting frustrated with little things is, is a really fun way to make to normalize that. You should be challenged and you will have roadblocks. And so starting with that and like learning to laugh about your challenges is um, a great place to start and then getting them talking about how did you debug? What did you go through in your mental processes? What um, technical skills did you use to address your, your, your problems with your code? And then that leads naturally to what were your successes? Like how did you overcome these challenges? Um, how did you reroute or restructure your code in order to get um, to these places? And what new ideas did you have that you could add on or additions or extensions? Um, so, and then I really like to tie these reflection questions into those girls who code values and bringing them back um, repeatedly because I think they're really important, not just for girls to become coders, but for girls to just go out and reach all of their dreams and whatever they want to do. So the values being bravery, sisterhood, and activism, being a part of our communities and each other's lives. So take a minute to reflect on your experience with your flashing heart and smiley face, frowny face experience. What were the challenges that you had? How did you debug and overcome those challenges? And what were some of the successes and what did that feel like? Take a minute to celebrate. I think um, we have a survey that um, we're hoping you guys will fill out to kind of give us some feedback and, and connect. So if you have any questions, um, you can, our emails will be there. And if you are interested in connecting with this, hopefully we build a state community of girls who coders and uh, we can stay in touch and share experiences and, what, and learn from each other. Noelle? Oh, that's great. I totally agree. And I hope that you guys send us an email because if pretty much in any community, in any situation, we can make Girls Who Code happen. And we've seen some pretty amazing stuff come out of it. Um, and I just love thinking about Alaska leading the way and closing the gender gap in tech through supporting young women. I think um, the last couple of years, Noel and I have had a chance to work with um, communities around the state with, with coders and girls who code. And it's really fun being from Alaska because it's such a um, the opposite of coding. So we tend to get a lot of um, attention and it is really fun to be leading the way as Alaskans. I think that Alaskans have a lot of natural problem solving and curiosity that, that apply to coding. We call it duct tape of problem solving. So um, it's, a, it's a good place to be. All right, we hope to hear from all of you. Thanks for bearing with us on our first pre-recorded pod podcast webinar. Workshop. <laughs> <laughs> classroom and feedback and conversation. Thank you. Thank you.